I'm delighted to be here, and I know that I come in a long line of very, very distinguished speakers, which is a little intimidating. But I want to thank uh, Peter Pels, who was chairman of the jury, uh, for selecting me for this honor. And I want to thank Wayne Modest for the first day of what is really a very stimulating uh, conference. I'm really delighted to be here. So my topic is materializing history, time and telos at Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. And essentially, what I'd like to do is to use this museum and my experience in helping to shape and create it to reflect on three sets of issues. The first, I'll pose it as two questions. Can, his, can the history of Polish Jews be, in a sense, um, saved from ethnography? And I say that because, um, in large measure, all of East European Jewish culture has at least in the popular imagination, been reduced to Fiddler on the Roof, to shtetl. And I can remember when, starting on this project in the mid-2000s, one of the donors asked me what my field was, and when I said folklore and ethnography, <coughs> he went, then this exhibition is going to be teepees and feathers. Well, speaking of feathers, we've just heard about feathers. And the second, can history be purged of memory? And this is a very, very, very serious question for us, as, as I hope I'll be able to show. So the first is, can the history of Polish Jews be saved from ethnography, and can history be purged of memory? That's the first set of questions that I'd like to explore. The second um, is, if you will, the value of process over matter. And you'll see why that's such a critically important part of the project in Warsaw uh, in just a moment and the role of intangible heritage in, as what makes matter, matter. And I have a wonderful example, I think, that uh, will we'll bring this, this point home. And the last uh, has to do with uh, the approach that we've used in creating the core exhibition, which I would call a theater of history. And this really speaks to the convergence of two strands in the history of museums. One is the strand that comes from the history of collecting, that leads to cabinets of curiosity, that then leads to the systematic museum. But the other is a history of exhibition that develops from World's Fairs that also lead to the formation of museums, the Chicago World's Fair and the Field Museum being a classic example. And if you will, the first strand is very much in the vein of preservation, which is what we've been hearing about largely today and material culture, but the second, in fact, is about experimentation and is, um, by its very nature, about exhibition and about performance. And it's those two strands that come together in the work that I've done, and, um, and they're quite easily misunderstood. As you'll see from the material that I'll show, uh, essentially, there are two approaches to, to exhibition, one is what I would call the white cube and the other is the black box. The white cube is very much the space of contemporary art, of art galleries, an abstract neutral space in which one, uh, usually it's a space for, for, for exhibiting contemporary art. But the black box is essentially a theater space and the approach that we use is rather more what I would call a black box than a white cube um, uh, space. And so, um, the, the museum that I'll present to you is, just a second, let me just go back. I don't know quite how this happened. Okay. The museum that I'll present to you, I think of as a Gesamtkunstwerk, as all of a piece, as presumably many other museums are too. But this one, if you will, is a Gesamtkunstwerk from birth. So materializing history, time, telos, and the Polin Museum of the History of Polish Jews. It's not often that a museum makes history as well as chronicles it, and rare too when otherwise cautious observers remark at the opening of a new museum that it may prove a source of hope and pride that propels an entire society forward. Both of those things happened this week in Warsaw with the opening of Polin Museum. And this is a comment that was made by Arnold Eisen Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America just after the October 28, 1914 grand opening of Polin Museum and its core exhibition. 
Polyne Museum basically is created on this site. This is what the Warsaw Ghetto looked like after the Germans suppressed the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in 1943. And so literally, the museum is created on the rubble. There are no historic buildings. We didn't start with a collection. What we started with was a story. And it's the story that really is the inspiration for the exhibition. It's the exhibition that sits at the heart of the museum. This is not the way museums normally think about themselves, or this is not the usual history of museums. Often museums start from a collection, and then you have the museum. Here, you have first of all the story, then the plan for the exhibition, then the establishment of the museum, then the, uh, the architecture, and then the completing of the project. So it's a museum that was created from the inside out and created from the story. This is the site of the the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, 1948. And you can see here, this is the monument to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It's being unveiled on the rubble of the ghetto. You can see the destroyed city of Warsaw in the background, because a year after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there was the Warsaw Uprising. And by the end of that uprising, the Germans had destroyed 80% of the city of Warsaw. And so, this monument is an absolutely critical element in defining the site. On one side of the monument, this is a monument by Natan Rapoport, who actually survived in the Soviet Union during the war. And when he got word of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and its suppression, he immediately began designing the monument. And that would have been basically in May, June, July of 1943. And on the other side of the monument, is the uh, commemoration of the deportation of 300,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto um, in the summer of 1942, and they were, they were killed in Treblinka. Even in the 1990s, when the museum was just coming up as an idea, the idea for the museum arose actually in 1993 uh, with the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And there was the sense that if there was a Holocaust museum in Washington, there should be a museum of the history of Polish Jews in Poland. But the last thing that Poland needed was a Holocaust museum because in a sense, the entire country was already a Holocaust museum in the sense that this was where the Germans had created all the death camps. This is where 90% of Polish Jews were murdered. This is where European Jews were brought to their death. And so the marks, the scars, and the stain of the Holocaust is very, very, uh, if you will, embedded within the landscape and within the memorial landscape of Poland. But the history of Polish Jews, which is a thousand year history, it's exaggerating a little bit, but it, we start the story in the 10th century, that the history of Polish Jews has been largely overshadowed by the cataclysmic events of the Holocaust, quite understandably. But nonetheless, uh, we felt that it was very, very impo important to recover that history, to recover the memory of that history, and to transmit it. Now, in the 90s, even before there was an agreement to create the museum, the city of Warsaw had already allocated this orange area facing that monument. And you can see that after the war, and it took decades to clear the rubble, the city basically left this whole area as a park and then built these communist era apartment houses around it. So this area, in the event of a miracle, that such a museum would be built, this area was already allocated by the city. Now, the, what's critical to understand is that this project was initiated not by the city and not by the state, but by a Jewish NGO in Poland that had been established right after the war, and that's the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland. And they, in 1993, without any experience in making an exhibition, making a museum, or raising a penny, had this great idea. And I like to think that only because they were so idealistic and so unrealistic could they have ever imagined such a project. Anybody realistic would have said, forget about it, it's not possible. And they basically held on to this idea, and they worked with a little bit of money they had in developing a master plan for the exhibition, I'll say more about that in a moment, until 2005, in other words, for about 12 years, until they were able to convince the city of Warsaw and the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage to join them in a unique public-private partnership for a cultural institution in Poland. And it was only in 2005 that the architectural competition was held, the first successful international architectural competition for a public building in Poland, 
was held, and the winner was a Finnish architect, Rainer Machlamaki. And you can see that what he's done is to create a minimalist geometrical building that stands in a respectful relationship to the monument and that echoes its geometry. And that um, is really, um, how can I say, it places the drama on the inside, as I'll show you in just a moment. There were 250 submissions to this architectural competition, 11 finalists, and this was the winner. Uh, the architects like to say that second prize is the best prize because you get the prize and you don't have to build it. But I can assure you that Daniel Liebeskind and others uh, who were second, third, and fourth uh, didn't uh, agree. The brilliance of this building, among other things, has to do with it being, uh, having a, um, a wonderful glass exterior that's like scales on a fish, on which is silk screen the word Pauline, which is the Hebrew and Yiddish word, Pauline, Poyln, for Poland, in Hebrew and in Latin letters. And what that does is to create a building of glass, which is extraordinary to create a glass building on a site of genocide, which I take as a statement of hope in the face of tragedy, and that this the glass is a message of transparency, um, reflection, light, openness, and what it does is to de dematerialize the bulk of the building. And so this, from the other side, is the largest glass window in Poland, and light moves all the way through from one end of the building to the other. The drama is on the inside, and the building's extremely sensitive to light. And this is the, if you will, the beginning of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which is to say, that it's a site-specific museum. It sits in relationship to the monument. The monument is the most iconic place in all of Warsaw. The most, uh, that, that is, if anyone comes to Warsaw and is interested or cares about the Jewish presence that was once there and about what happened to Jews during the war, the, the obligatory visit is to the monument. It is absolutely iconic. So to place this building in this museum in relation to the monument is to complete the memorial complex, which is to say that if we want to honor those who died, we go to the, to the monument and remember how they died. But the task of memory is not complete if we do not also remember how they lived. And so we come to the museum to honor them and honor those who came before by remembering how they lived and how they lived for a thousand years. And in that way, the museum completes the, the memorial complex without itself being a memorial, which I'll come back to this issue of Persian history of memory. Once in the building, um, the, the, and it's an educational cultural center, the entrance to the core exhibition is from the main floor down a very grand set of stairs that essentially separates the visitor from everyday life and primes them, it's a priming experience to lead them into the story and into what we call a theater of history. Uh, now, I wanna emphasize again that we started without a collection. We formed a collection for the exhibition, but this thousand year story, is for, for the story that we wanna tell, there are many parts of the story for which there simply are no objects. It isn't that we don't have them, there are none. And so if one puts the story first, and one has to find a way to tell it, then we do show and we do use objects, but we do a lot of other things. And in that way, I would say that this museum and this exhibition is coming more strongly from what I would call the world's fair, um, um, experimental and exhibitionary, uh, or actually expositionary uh, historical track, rather than from the collections track that comes through collections, curiosity cab uh, cabinets, and systematic museums. Now, vitrines of objects and objects will play an important role, but above all, we've created uh, a theater of history, and we've worked with a principle of what we call narrative space, and we work very scenographic. And what, what scenographically, now what kind of a theater is it? You could call it um, theater of mise-en-scene, scenographic theater, still life theater, it's a theater that works with space, first and foremost, and it's working with a very particular, if you will, notion of the visitor experience, which is predicated not only on vision, but on movement. And I think this was mentioned earlier today, but what I would argue is that a defining feature of the museum experience or exhibition experience is movement through space. 
that only as the visitor moves does the story unfold, and that the emphasis that we have traditionally placed on vision, um, in a sense, uh, it's, the, its movement is, that the, invis is the invisible uh, piece of the visitor, of, of what defines um, an exhibition experience. And what, uh, how I would do it is this, that in a theater, not unlike the situation today, that is that you are sitting in a seat that's fixed and what you're looking at moves. And in traditional, if you, if you will, even in this exhibition, it's the exact opposite. And that is that what you're looking at is still and you move. And it's your movement that activates the space. And, and the idea of, of narrative space has very much to do with the way in which the space itself is deployed to help to tell the story. And I, I'll, I'll try and give you some examples. So how do we make this exhibition? Uh, how do you make such an exhibition? If you're not starting from a collection, what are you starting from? And so the first step in the 90s was to create an outline of the historical program. This was a document that ran about 120 pages, 150 pages, and it essentially um, communicated the fullness of the story that needed to be told. It was quite, I, I would say that what we eventually did was brought a kind of meta-historical perspective, but this was a good starting point. A database, which is now about 70,000 items, of every conceivable document, photograph, object, anything that could be of possible interest and possible use to the designers in, in essentially creating our theater of history, and then a master plan. Now, speaking of time, one of the most interesting uh, exercises, uh, I began consulting on the project in 2002, and I was asked to lead the development of the exhibition in 2006. And so one of the first things we did, we put together an international um, academic team with scholars from Poland, the United States, and Israel. And the first thing we did was to take the master plan and to really look at it carefully and decide what we would accept and what we would change. So um, let, let me take you through the basic, the DNA of the master plan, and then you'll see what we did and why it was, uh, why it was important. So first of all, the designers thought it a good idea to divide the history up into sections and between each section and, and to make the divisions of each section something they called a turning point. And we said, the first thing we said is, history is not made up of a series of turning points, but rather we're dealing with a process, we're dealing with, in some cases, really long durée, and some events that have been considered uh, turning points historiographically today are not. So that was the first thing, no turning points. That was the, the, the first. There were critical events, they were defining events, but the idea of a turning point was, uh, a, a, as a division for every gallery in every historical period, we said was schematic, and so that was out. The second is that they created something called, uh, it's called the Polish context here, and this is to be the Polish, the Polish European timeline and something called Polish context. No way. And that is, the history of Polish Jews was not to be a footnote to the history of Poland, and we were not going to create a contextual exhibition. We were going to create what we would call a relational exhibition, which is not the same thing as Polish-Jewish relations, but we were not going to create something called Polish context as something separate, and then have this Jewish historical line, and then have a series of trans-historical galleries dealing, for example, here, a, um, a presentation of Jewish culture, who are the Jews, what is Judaism, no way. First of all, why would you treat culture trans-historically, and by the time you've done that, what's left for here? So that was the first thing to go. No separate Polish-European timeline, no separate Polish context, no trans-historical galleries, and no normative presentation of Judaism, and no who are the Jews. Um, I can remember visiting the Jewish Museum in London, which is an interesting and a very good museum, and I remember walking in, and there's two introductory text panels. Who are the Jews? What is Judaism? I don't know how many times I have visited and how many times I've read it, and I can't remember a word. <laughs> I don't remember anything. You know, 100 words, who are the Jews? 100 words, what is Judaism? So our visitors are on a need-to-know basis. When they need to know what is the Sabbath or why Jews can't ride on the Sabbath, we'll tell them. But no, no, no normative, no, no, no uh, how can I say, 
uh, no calendar year, life cycle, none of those categories. But And I'll show you in a moment what we do do. So basically, we um, collapsed these three lines, and what we did instead was develop a set of meta-historical meta principles. So I like to say that we don't, that we reject the idea of a master narrative. And so Moshe Rossman, one of my favorite historians, who works on the early modern period of Polish Jews, the 17th and 18th centuries, he said, okay, he said, no master narrative, he said, but there are meta-historical principles. So what are they? So the first is that this, uh, that the most important period in the history of Polish Jews is one thousand years. Now why is that important? I can't tell you how many times I've been asked what is the most important period in the history of Polish Jews and whoever asks usually already knows the answer. For some it's the Holocaust, for some it's the post-war years because they lived through it, for some it's the interwar years because that's the time of their parents or their grandparents, but nobody says the medieval period which is almost 600 years which is more than half of the entire millennium. Nobody. And as for the uh, 16th, 17th century, there might be some, 19th century maybe. I even had one donor say to me, the whole thing should be the 20th century. You don't have any material for the rest, you made it all up. So, uh, and my answer is that the message, the message of 1,000 years is a, is a huge message, especially because this uh, country is not only the place where the largest Jewish community once lived, it's also the place where they died. And the world knows more about how they died than how they lived, and their thousand year history has come to be defined by the Holocaust and to be understood and seen through the lens of the Holocaust. So we have a huge task to recover this thousand year history in its own terms, and it has a huge amount to do with time, as I'll explain in just a moment. The second principle is that Jews are an integral part of the history of Poland. They were not only in Poland, but also <laughs> of Poland, which is why we reject the idea of a Polish historical context, why we reject the idea of a contextual uh, history. That this is a story of coexistence and conflict, cooperation and competition, separation and integration. And this is incredibly important because I would say that until recently, those in Poland, that is to say at Warsaw University or Lublin or wherever they're teaching, who were working on the history of Polish Jews weren't working on the history of Polish Jews. They were working on the history of Polish Jewish relations, which is a euphemism for the history of anti-Semitism, which is actually not about Jews, it's about Poles. And so the idea of creating a museum that would put forward what a history of Polish Jews might look like that is not a history of Polish-Jewish relations, anti-Semitism, and Poles in the first instance meant to look at a spectrum <laughs> of relations and not only at those that are the most painful, most difficult, uh, although of course we deal with them as well. That Polish Jews created a civilization that is categorically Jewish, distinctly Polish. In other words, and we have some wonderful examples of the kind of symbiosis, and this works against the idea that Jews in Poland lived in little oases in quote, so-called ghettos, which didn't exist until uh, during the Holocaust. Um, and so the idea of categorically Jewish, distinctly Polish, the idea that, these, that both can coexist and that this is not a modern phenomenon, but it is a feature of the entire history, um, this was something that, this was a meta-historical principle that was very important to us. That Polish Jews became the largest Jewish community in the world and a center of the Jewish world. And of course, for that to happen, uh, there, had to, there had to be more going on here than violence. And the power of telling the story in the very place where it happened. Now that might seem self-evident, but I can't tell you how many times when I was presenting this project in the 2007, 8, 9, I had people saying to me, why are you making this museum in Poland? I said, well, where should I make it? They said, Tel Aviv or New York. Why? Because there are Jews there. Now, of course, there are Jews in Poland, but not as many as in New York and Tel Aviv. But to tell the story in the very place where it happened is <coughs> inestimable. We're able to harness the emotional power of the site. And the site is a site of conscience. And our goal is to create a trusted zone a zone of trust, if you will, for engaging difficult subjects. And that is a critical, critical function 
um, of this museum and not only its core exhibition, but of everything that it does. So now what I'd like to do is to really demonstrate the larger principles that I laid out at the very beginning, but I want to, lay, I want to uh, demonstrate them using the exhibition itself. And so the exhibition actually begins with a kind of prelude, um, which is a space of historical imagination. It's time before time. It is a space that's inspired by a legend that Jews told themselves about how they came to Poland and why they stayed. And we use a beautiful version of this legend by Agnon, uh, the Nobel Prize winning Hebrew writer. And the story goes something like this, that Jews were fleeing persecution in the West, they came East, and they found themselves in a forest, and then they heard the word Pauline, which they understood to be Hebrew, and they heard it as Paul here, lean, here, rest, here you should rest, here you should dwell. The legend varies. Sometimes birds are chirping, sometimes the clouds break and an angel's hand points, sometimes pages of the Gemara of the sacred text from the Talmud uh, uh, floats down, uh, Hebrew words are carved on the trees. There are lots of different versions of it. But the idea of starting with the space of historical imagination, the idea of starting with the story the Jews told themselves about how they came to Poland and why they stayed, and a story that, uh, from a Jewish perspective, suggests that it was divinely ordained that they should come and stay until they were taken to the land of Israel. In other words, until the Messiah comes, which is a very, very long time. Now, when the, the uh, visitor uh, goes from the forest, goes from the space of historical imagination into the first historical gallery, the visitor crosses a threshold between legend and history. And the, uh, a, a, a major principle in this exhibition is to narrate in the, I, I would put it in quotation marks, first person and in the historical present, in the historical present. And one of the first quotes, there, the, there are several quotes on the way into the gallery, one of the first quotes in this particular gallery is in Arabic, which comes as a wonderful surprise to our visitors. And it comes from a travel account by Ibrahim Ibn Yaqub, a, a Jew from Cordoba who was sent by the Caliph on a diplomatic mission across Europe. And what we do, and this is a matter of principle, and we've been taken to task for it, but I will defend it to the hilt. And that is, what we do is, if it's a major quotation, it's in large letters, it's in the original language, it's in a font from the period, each gallery has its own historical font, both for the Latin letter languages and for Hebrew, Yiddish, Arabic, whatever it might be. And then in our languages of communication, which are in uh, Polish, of course, and in English. Now, in this particular gallery, the medieval gallery from 965, that quote comes from a travel account. And it is he, uh, Ibrahim Ibn Yaqub in, and the Holocaust are the only two things that Polish school children know about or ever hear about Jews in Poland. Well, Holocaust, you can understand by why this guy? Because his travel account is the earliest extant description of Poland, 965. So they know about Ibrahim Ibn Yaqub, and hopefully now they'll know something about what happened between him and the Holocaust and even after. But for this period, 965 to about 1507, there are in the world only two kinds of objects for telling this story. One of them is a coin, coins, bracteates, one-sided coins with Hebrew inscriptions from the end of the 12th and beginning of the 13th century. And the other are tombstones, that is say Jewish tombstones, Hebrew inscriptions, the earliest is 1203. That's it. And so how do you make a story from 965 to 1507 with tombstones and coins? And the coins incidentally are very small, they're extremely difficult to see, so and we have one and we show one, but it's it's um, it's that big. It's the size of a penny. So what we did, we did. So what we did basically is we quote materialized history by going to intangible heritage, which we took from texts, mainly rabbinical responsa. That is to say. Um, what's called Shadis uh, um rabbinical correspondence around Jewish case law, essentially. Something happens, there's an issue, the rabbis correspond with each other, and actually we have material that really gives us insights into what was going on in this territory in the medieval period with Jewish travelers and in, with this early small Jewish settlements 
we use chronicles, legal documents, all kinds of material. And so having, in a sense, um, excavated from th those materials uh, what, what can be known about the history of Polish Jews from 965 to 1507, we then took manuscript illuminations, Hebrew and Christian, from the period and from the Ashkenazi region, meaning from the Rhineland, from Western Europe, but also from this territory in the case of the Christian ones. And we took our stories, we took these manuscripts, and we went to two of Poland's most favorite comic book artists, and we asked them to illustrate those stories in the style of these manuscripts, following the periodization of manuscript illumination across this almost 600 year period. And then we hired three conservators that specialize in the conservation of the painted interiors of medieval Renaissance and later Polish churches, and we had them hand paint the walls. And the result is a 360 degree life-size illuminated manuscript that in, in a gallery that is virtually entirely hand painted and hand gilded with real gold. So in other words, it's a very material exhibition in the absence of material objects. And it's very touchable. You can touch just about everything. And so this, um, to create a hand painted gallery in a multimedia narrative exhibition is not what you would expect. You'd expect everything to be high tech projections and that kind of thing. Now, the, the second point I would like to make is this idea of narrative space. And the idea of narrative space is to organize the story in space. And so in this case, the, the story of, if you will, the legal status of Jews and their relationship to the rulers moves along this wall. And the story of the urbanization of Poland and the role of Jews and the place of Jews in the earliest towns of Poland is on the opposite wall. And at the two ends, are the story of, if you will, Jews in relation to others in the town, and here the internal workings, which can be explored interactively of the Jewish community itself. And a fundamental to the structure of this kind of an exhibition, but also in any exhibition, is what you would call a hierarchy of communication. So that your visitor, I mean, in the, in the, in the profession, some have distinguished three kinds of visitors. Skimmers, swimmers, and divers. So for the, for the skimmers, then the layer one, those big quotes, uh, and also this iconography, sonography, communicate for a quick visit what the main point is. For the swimmers, there's a level down, the sort of layer two, and for the divers, there, in large measure, it's another layer down, and oftentimes it's an interactive presentation. When we cross from the medieval gallery, which is this almost 600 year period, to the period of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is 1569 to 1772, we enter what in Polish uh, historiography is often considered a golden age, which we know is a trope. But nonetheless, it is a period when Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine form one very, very large country, which today also includes Belarus, Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, and other, um, other areas in the Baltics, parts of Russia. And it was the time when this territory becomes home to the very largest Jewish community. It's an open plan gallery. It's organized thematically. It is, if you will, long durée. It's defined by the onset of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and, it, and by its dissolution, but within it, the periodization, if you will, is a periodization that's meaningful within the history of Polish Jews, but not within the history of Poland, namely the events of 1648-49, the Chmielnicki um, uprising. Now, as it turns out, that given that we could have had as much high, not as much, but a lot and even more high-tech um, multimedia elements, it turns out that among the most popular and most memorable are things that are very low tech and manual. And that I think came to, at first, I didn't want to have any computers of any kind. And then when I discovered what we could do with media and with interactivity, that's all I wanted. And then when I was told that there wasn't enough power supply, money or time, then I was devastated. And so then um, the solution was going to be these so-called manual interactives. And I thought, oh, that's a consolation prize. You know, but that's, <laughs> what am I gonna do? Um, and then I discovered they're fantastic. You can do wonderful things. So 
How do you take the story? Uh, all right, so what made the age quote golden from the point of view of Polish Jews? Number one, the rise of rabbinical authority, Hebrew and Yiddish printing, scholarship, yeshivas, religious academies, that the idea that the center of religious authority for the Ashkenazi Jew, uh, Jewish world had shifted to this territory, this was one, and the second was a very, very high degree of Jewish self-government, of Jewish communal autonomy. But how do you bring that printing story to life when the books are in a language that nobody, you know, none of our, very few of our visitors can read, and even if they could read them, they're really esoteric. One of the most important, the Sharei Dura, is a manual for men who are gonna be responsible for, for kashrut, for kosher food, and the first couple of pages are about the details, the minutiae of salting meat. And so, in terms of an interesting, a 15-year-old Polish boy, a hardship case, uh, it, we thought that was something of a challenge. And so, what we, what we did was two things, one, we created four printing presses, and they really are presses. And they were specifically designed for this exhibition. And our visitors are able to, uh, to print uh, the earliest print Jewish printer's marks, the, the, er the title page of one of the most important early uh, books, the Code of Jewish Law. And then in our virtual library, uh, actually cross that out, in our library, um, we have an opportunity to open those books up so our visitors can explore them because we do show an original book, but you open it to one page and that's the end of it. And then you can read a little text. But here, what we're able to do is to take extremely rare material that's never been shown before. For example, a Kabbalistic scroll that was lost in the British Museum because somebody got the numbers mixed up and we finally found it and got a very good scan and this is an incredible Kabbalistic manuscript, which was copied from one in Modena in the 16th century by one of the figures in our story, one of the, um, uh, David Darshan, one of the men who is actually one of our Polish Jews, who as a spiritual exercise, and this was part of uh, a way in which a young man who had aspirations would, in a sense, prepare himself, he would copy, and you can imagine, took months to copy this uh, mystical scroll. And our visitors are now able to ex extend it, get commentary on it, and explore it in a way that would otherwise be absolutely impossible. 1648 to 49 is a turning point. Uh, it, it, well, it's not really a turning point. Actually, it's not a turning point. Let's scratch that. Um, it is an event. <laughs> It's not a turning point. Um, it used to be thought of as a turning point because uh, it's such a cataclysmic event. But in fact, historiographically, uh, cataclysmic as it was, this was a Cossack uprising led by Bogdan Khmielnytsky, a great hero in Ukraine, unfortunately. And um, it, it, in this period uh, and in this event, uh, basically the Cossacks and the Orthodox peasant, peasants uh, revolted against the Polish nobility, the Catholic <coughs> Church, and the Jews who worked for the nobility, and a third of the Jewish population of Ukraine was murdered, many fled, others were forced to convert, and it's remembered as the worst event between the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the, and the Holocaust. So in Jewish memory, it's this really a terrible event. However, uh, um, historians working today argue that by the end of the 17th century, which was a century of war, the Commonwealth was at war with Russia, with Sweden, uh, with Turkey, that by the end of the century, in fact, the Commonwealth had started to rebound, the towns were recovering, Jewish communities renewing themselves, and life went on, not exactly the same as before, but there wasn't a kind of revolutionary turn. And so the idea of a turning point has really been rejected. And what we do here is consistent with what we do all the way through the exhibition, and that is we narrate it from a source from the period, um, it's, a, it's called Yeva Mitsula, Abyss of Despair, written by Nathan Hanover, who witnessed the massacre in his own town and then collected eyewitness accounts from others. In just a few years, I think uh, maybe 5, uh, 48 to 53, about se seven years more or less after the event, he actually printed a book of, this, of these accounts. And that's what we include here. But then in our own text, we in a sense update <laughs> the information of the numbers and various other things which he, wouldn't have, he would not have known. But our first way in is 
in the historical present and in the first person, and I'll explain in a moment why, why that's so critically important. When we come to the period after the Khmelnytsky uprising, the second half of the 17th century and the 18th century, then we zoom in and we have a very close focus. In the previous gallery, which was the first half of the Commonwealth period, when Poland is so huge, Poland and Lithuania are so huge, in that first part, it's a kind of big picture. It's got a big scale model. It's the story of printing and rabbis, communal autonomy. It's really, really big, 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 big picture. Here, what we've done is to zoom in. This is probably the most ethnographic moment in the entire exhibition, not by intention, but I think um, basically because it's social and cultural history of everyday life of ordinary Jews in the most typical form of Jewish settlement, which is in private noble towns, or certainly in towns, where Jews made up a substantial proportion of the population. So what that means is that although Jews might, in, for example, in the interwar years, they made up to 10% of the population, in a place like Bialystok, they were 70% of the population, or my father's town, 6,500, so 65%. So wherever they settled, they were concentrated, and that gave these towns a peculiar character, but their critical mass also made it possible for them to, dis to, to create a very distinctive way of life. And that's the, it's that zoom in, and it's the coherence of creating, if you will, um, a setting that is a setting, a platform, and also a phenomenon. And that's a fundamental principle we use all the way through. And so there are a number of thematic areas, one of which is the Jewish home, and another is the church. We're probably the only museum of Jewish history in the world that has a church. And uh, some Israeli visitors came and they didn't recognize it as a church. And I said to a friend, I said to one of my colleagues, I don't understand, it's obvious. And he said, where's the cross? I said, well, I, I don't know if I can go that far. So we've, <laughs> we've got the church, but we don't have the cross. But, what we, but our interest was not in the church per se, it was in the relationship, the changing relationship of the church and the Jews. And what we did is to set it. It's not a period room. It is not a literal recreation. It is, if you will, an evocation. It is a setting that is at the same time a platform and also an opportunity, a platform for exploring a phenomenon. So a setting, a platform, and a phenomenon. And it's the way those come together that creates a very special experience for our visitors because, um, you know, that we've had various and sundry, um, you know, responses, mostly positive, but one of the criticisms, and some of the criticisms are the best. So one guy said, multimedia, narrative exhibition, no objects. He said, you could put that whole exhibition on two DVDs and watch it at home. So I, I thought to myself, really? Um, well, what would that be like? You'll sit in your basement in front of your monitor and you know, you'll, you'll, I don't know what you'll see, but it's not, it, you can't compare exploring any of the subjects that we uh, provide, which are completely, you know, the exploration is completely conditioned by the setting. The setting is absolutely critical. And so what we've done here is used as a setting for our, for I, I would say the um, uh, most dramatic element in our church setting platform phenomenon, which is the story of Jacob Frank, who was, um, what can I say, very bad boy, uh, essentially uh, believed by his followers to be a messiah and turned out, of course, not to be. Now, perhaps the, um, just a second, perhaps the, the best example and the one that's most relevant to, to the whole debate and discussion uh, at the conference today and also tomorrow is this. Now, what is this? So let me start by saying what it's not. It is not a copy, a replica, a reproduction, a recreation, a reconstruction. It is not a version of something else. It is a new kind of object. It is actually exactly what it is. And it is, if you will, a prime example of what I would call the materialization of history. And it is the outcome of a process that is of the highest value. And in order for that process to happen, it had to express itself in material. So let me, let me explain precisely um, how it works in this case and why I think of it as being a very Japanese approach. 
<laughs> so, during the period of the Commonwealth, which means uh, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, so 1569 to 1772, there were hundreds of magnificent wooden synagogues across the length and breadth of the Commonwealth. The great ones were created in the 17th and 18th centuries. Maybe earlier, but the ones that we know of that survived into the 20th century were created largely, say, in the 1600s and 1700s. Absolutely magnificent. And um, some of them died a natural death in the sense that there wooden buildings, fire. The one that once stood in Gvozdjets, which is today in Ukraine, um, it actually burnt down during World War I when the Russian front moved through Gvozdjets. Gvozdjets is not, is not far from Kolomea, a little bit further from, from Lviv. The rest, the rest of these synagogues, whatever was left standing, the Germans destroyed during, uh, during World War II. So none of these magnificent synagogues exist. None of them exist today. And so we uh, partnered with an, a nonprofit educational studio in Massachusetts uh, called Hans House Studio. They have a great mission statement. I only wish I, uh, we had such a poetic mission statement. Their mission statement is to recover lost objects. Now, they were recovering a wooden submarine from the 18th century, a, a crane, um, a basilisk, they were recovering all kinds of things. But when they discovered wooden synagogues, they discovered their ultimate lost object. And what they say is you can never recover the original object in the sense of the original material, but you can recover the knowledge, the knowledge of how to build it by building it using traditional tools, techniques, and materials. And the idea is that you would create new knowledge through this process and that this new knowledge is different from the documentation. Because as it turns out, this particular synagogue is the best documented of any wooden synagogue of all of them. Even though it was destroyed in 1914, it's actually the best documented. We have documentation starting from 1890, uh, uh, a painting, uh, of one section of it from 1897, and hundreds of photographs, drawings, floor plans, measurements between 1910 and 1913, created by Alois Breyer, who was an art architectural historian from Vienna. So, but the, the knowledge that's recovered is embodied knowledge. It's a knowledge that is, if you will, the body is the archive, and the way in which to excavate that embodied knowledge is through the use of these tools, materials, and techniques it, on the basis of the documentation. And so that's what we did with 300 volunteers, which I think of also as a gold standard in terms of museum education and outreach, which I'll, I'll explain in just a sec. So, so here you have the, um, the ceiling, and we also reconstructed, oops, we also built the roof. Um, and the ceiling and roof are 85% scale, and the BIMA, the, re the reader's platform in the middle, is 100% scale. It was created exactly the same way. And just to show you what we did. So we started with 200 raw logs with the bark still on, and uh, we worked at an open air, like a Skansen museum, an open air folk architecture museum in the south of Poland, outside of Sanok. And we worked with the Timber Framers Guild. The Timber Framers Guild are ma made up of timber framing ma maniacs. These are people that are absolutely crazy about this um, kind of architecture and about the historical tools and methods for creating it. And so they brought their tools with them in ski bags and golf bags. They came from the United States. They came from other parts of Europe. And in six weeks and three two-week workshops with volunteers, we did the all the timber framing and also the panels for the roof structure and also for the ceiling. So the documentation. So first of all, the photographs. Even though, you know, compared with the inside, the outside doesn't look like much, I actually think it's beautiful, uh, uh, architecturally, uh, a kind of very grand, beautiful um, architectural form. And structurally, inside, it's actually quite complicated in terms of its engineering. So the, 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 this is a documentation from Alois Breyer. These, this gives you an idea of the kinds of uh, materials we had to work with. And, um, and then what we did is we took 
that whole structure apart in the south of Poland, pulled out the pegs because it's like a wooden puzzle and, and numbered all the parts and then brought all the parts to Warsaw and we put them in the exhibition level of our permanent exhibition. We reassembled it, we put the <laughs> pegs back in and then we hoisted it, it's 25 tons, and we suspended it from cables so it's actually floating. So I call it a celestial canopy. One of the people writing about it in the press called it our Sistine Chapel. I'm not so sure about this metaphor, but nonetheless. But then what we did is that the painted ceiling, we did it in eight workshops. We divided the painted ceiling into eight sections and we created eight workshops and we conducted those workshops in existing standing masonry synagogues in different cities and towns in Poland from Gdańsk to Kazimierz Dolna, Kazimierz Krakow, Sejna, uh, Szebrzeszyn, Rzeszów, Warsaw, and involved local communities, places where, there's no, where there are no Jews living today, where once the town was majority Jewish and invited them in and got the buy-in of the mayor, local media, and in each of these workshops, uh, basically all the work, all the painting was done by, by students, by volunteers, under the expert direction of specialists. Just one second. And so this in particular was done in uh, Wrocław in the White Stork Synagogue. When I say we, organ we use the principle of narrative space and we organize the story in space, one of the things that we did is all around the external um, uh, this, the, the perimeter of the synagogue is where we introduced new religious leaders and new spiritual movements and went from heresy, which was Jacob Frank and the church, to heterodoxy. And each of them involved the installation of media. So what happens here is, this is in fact a film, but it's set within a painted, um, I, don't, I forgot what you call it, a painted kind of a shell. I don't know how to explain it, but the walls are painted and the film has been created so that it will sit within that painted setting. In other words, what we wanted to do was to avoid media feeling like you were looking at movies on a cineplex, on a screen or on a monitor in the way that you would at home. And so in a kind of circumference, circling the synagogue are the her her heretic and the heterodox. That means the founder, if you will, what was later, the individual who was later claimed as the founder of the modern yeshiva, of Hasidism in the case of the Baal Shem Tov, and the Jewish Enlightenment. When we come to the, um, to the end of, this, of the Commonwealth, essentially, to 1772, we come to a period when the Commonwealth was understood as a republic of nobles, decentralized, the power primarily in the hands of the nobility, very weak army, and essentially Russia, Prussia, and Austria looked at the Commonwealth and said, let's each take a piece of the royal cake. And they fundamentally divided the Commonwealth up, they partitioned it, each took a piece, and the long 19th century, from 1772 until World War I, there is no, there is no Poland, no Lithuania, no Ukraine. There are, if you will, there's the partition, that Russia took, the partition that Austria took, which they created a separate province called Galicia, and the partition that the Kingdom of Austria took. And the story of the 19th century unfolds in this uh, long 19th century in the three partitions of the former Commonwealth when the Commonwealth has disappeared from the face of the map and there is no, there is no Poland and there is no Lithuania. Now, one of the, um, in terms of narrative, narration, and time, the way in which we deal with the 19th century, I think, really speaks to our very particular approach, and that is that the changes in, the, the changes in this period between 1772 and 1914 were so dramatic that it uh, precipitated, those changes precipitated a spate of autobiographies and memoirs, unprecedented. The earliest, um, for, for this territory, the earliest memoir if you can even call it that, uh, that we have is from a, wine, a Jewish wine merchant, Ber Bolochov, or what, his name was also Dov Ber Birkenthal. And it's essentially his exploits as a wine exporter, uh, importer rather, from, from uh, uh, importing wine from Hungary to Poland. And, but otherwise, we don't have memoirs and autobiographies. But in the 19th century, the, the, you have people who lived from 1840 to World War I or even into the 20s, 
And their experience of change was so powerful that they can not only help us in describing the change, but what they do is they provide us with the consciousness of change. And so the entire 19th century is commented by quotations from these autobiographies and memoirs in a way that conveys both the actual changes, but more importantly, the experience of change and the consciousness of change. And so though, and all the sources are from the period and using our basic, our basic approach. Now, what do you do when you have nothing? Uh, basically nothing. In the case of the modern yeshiva, uh, and they were, we were looking at organized responses to the partitions and the new situation of being an individual subject to whether it's the, uh, the Empress of Russia or the Emperor of Austria or the King of Prussia. And uh, one of the organized responses was the Jewish Enlightenment, another one was the modern yeshiva, another one was the expansion of Hasidism, the Jewish mystical movement. And the case of the modern yeshiva, when I heard from the historians that we had to include it, I said, it really sounds boring, and I don't know how I'm going to interest a 15-year-old Polish boy in the modern yeshiva from the early 19th century. I said, where's the material? They said, there are no photographs, no paintings, no drawings, no visual material, and no objects. Okay, so what are we going to do? Uh, so what we did is we commissioned uh, a graduate student uh, being supervised by one of our colleagues who was writing his dissertation on the 19th century modern yeshiva. And his, one of his major, major, major sources were memoirs and autobiographies of students in these 19th century yeshivas, especially the yeshiva of Volozhin, which was the, the most famous one. And, um, the, and, and also accounts of people who visited. And he sent us back a selection of material. And when when I, in particular, because I was the most skeptical, read this material, I was completely blown away. So what we decided to do was to make a film, essentially an animation. And we created a script from quotations from one of those autobiographies of a young man who was completely, um, I would say, enthused and raptured by the experience of this new kind of yeshiva. And we then proceeded to um, cast actors, paint them, create a, a sonography in the studio, film these painted actors in a green, in a green, against a green screen, put it together, and then we made the film, and then we projected the film on canvas and refilmed it, and then projected it large in the area dedicated to the modern yeshiva so that it would, you'd have the sense of a 19th century painting that had come to life. But the narration is 24 hours in the modern yeshiva from dusk to dusk is the, with a clock that goes, takes four minutes to go around. The, it's 24 hours and four minutes, basically. And so this was a case, it's one of the most memorable elements in the exhibition. It probably communicates more effectively and more memorably what was, what was the modern yeshiva and why was it so important and so captivating to those who went there than if we had had original material. I hate to put it that way because I would have loved to have had original material. So that, that would be an example, not unlike our synagogue, of doing something with, uh, in the absence of, uh, of objects and material culture. When it comes to the middle of the 19th century, the pace of change picks up. And here we've created, again, an, a setting, if you will, a, a platform and a phenomenon. And the train station is the starting point, the railway, urbanization, industrialization. And this is a 360 degree multimedia, three minute, if you will, layer one uh, presentation. And we close out the gallery with uh, the rise of modern anti-Semitism and Jewish uh, political and cultural responses. When we come to the interwar years, we have a very special situation because we exactly have two decades, the 1920s and the 1930s, where Poland is an independent state and where up to 40% of the population of interwar year Poland is not ethnically Polish. They're Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Belarusian, German, Jewish. They're not ethnically Polish. And so you actually have a very, very special situation you have minority clauses attached to the Treaty of Versailles that, at least theoretically on paper, are supposed to protect national minority rights, and Jews are considered 
such a, a minority. And so we here organize the gallery thematically, although there is, um, and I'll show this to you in a moment, a timeline, um, in this very, very short period, it doesn't make, uh, it, it's not meaningful to organize this uh, story, if you will, along uh, a chronological line, nor did it make sense in the period of this uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, the period of the long, long durée of the Ancien Régime. And so here, an area dedicated to politics, along the politics area, a timeline just to orient the visitor very, very quickly, starting with Jews in the Polish parliament, ending with Jews and communism, two bookends to this timeline. Um, the story of um, the rise of modern uh, Yiddish culture, modern Jewish culture in the Yiddish language, also in the Polish language, um, and creating of a lot of manual things. In the case of here, the this, uh, you pull out the drawer and there are at least six or seven different music with uh, ex explanations of what they are. It's a kind of like Toy Story, many, many elements in the space you can handle and they will do something or they will communicate. Um, the other two thematic areas are growing up from uh, intergenerational conflict in the family setting all the way through education and adolescence. And, and here, the narration is through uh, youth autobiographies. During the 1930s, there were three contests organized by the Evo Institute for Jewish Research, and the youth autobiographies of young Jews between the ages of about 14, 15, and maybe 20, 21, hundreds of them were collected. And they are an extraordinary window to the what we think of as the youthful face of the interwar years. And so it's their voice that is the leading voice in, in, our, in our presentation. Uh, daily life across the length and breadth of Poland, and the view down the street. When you look down the street, you do not see the Holocaust. You only see this. And you see people looking up, and you don't know what they're looking up until you turn the corner. And it's at this moment that the principle of narrating in the historical present really uh, becomes, if you will, most dramatically apparent, and why. And that's because what we try to do is to resist the teleology of the Holocaust. We want to resist the feeling, as one's moving through the story, that the Holocaust is coming and that the story is leading inevitably to genocide. Because that fundamentally is, I would say, a, one of our biggest hurdles, and that is that this thousand-year history is seen, if it's seen at all, it's seen retrospectively through the lens of the Holocaust and prospectively as leading to the Holocaust. And that is the telos that we try to pull back on. And one of the ways we try to pull back on it is by narrating in the historical present and by asking our visitors to, to in a sense, stand in the shoes of those whose story we're telling and to try to uh, imagine the short horizon forward that they had. Now, when it comes to the 17th and 18th centuries, it's not a big deal, but when it comes to the interwar years, uh, we have a choice. We have, on the one hand, Celia Stopnitzer Heller's book with a title on the edge of uh, on the on the edge of destruction, and we have others who say that despite economic hardship and despite rising anti-Semitism, this was a kind of another golden age, given the political energy, given the cultural creativity, given the investment in youth, and so we really what we want is that our visitors should have a very, very short horizon forward, but as they move through the story, as they walk, the past gets deeper, 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 but the future is never very far ahead, and we try, not, uh, we try to encourage our visitors not to anticipate. And this is um, uh, uh, particularly in the case of the Holocaust Gallery, but also leading up to it is critically, critically important. And so the idea of narrating only with sources from the period, of narrating largely in the first person, of narrating in the historical present, this is um, absolutely essential to the experience we would like our visitors to, if you will, these are our rules of engagement, and we hope that our visitors would, in a sense, be open to proceeding in this way. You turn the corner and you see bombs falling on Warsaw. And basically, um, it, we do something, I think, quite unusual with the Holocaust, and that is, first of all, we set it within a 1,000-year history of Polish Jews. It's never set that way. 
It's invariably, invariably set within a thousand year history of anti-Semitism. And this thousand year history of Polish Jews is not first and foremost a thousand year history of anti-Semitism. That is to say that anti-Semitism, xenophobia, um, religious conflict, all of those elements are part of the story, but they're not the main story. They couldn't be the main story, and, and this uh, part of the world be home to the largest Jewish community in the world and a center of the Jewish world. So we have to, uh, we, we think that by situating this cataclysmic event within this thousand year history, that it actually creates a very, um, a, a unique opportunity to try to think about this history and try to think about this event. And so we set the Holocaust within the borders of occupied Poland, a country occupied first by the Germans and then 17 days later by the Soviets. And then we move into the German occupied part, the process of separation and isolation culminating with the forming of ghettos. And since we are on the site of the Warsaw Ghetto, we take the Warsaw Ghetto as our pars pro toto, which is also part of our approach. That is, rather than make a synthetic combo, a montage, collage, assemblage, synthesis, we would rather take one instance, let it be the town of Zamosh or the town of Poznan, or let it be the Warsaw Ghetto, we take one, and then we try through that one instance to communicate something wider. Now, our approach is very, um, I think, in, in, in its, it get, gets its most uh, precise expression actually in the Holocaust Gallery. And what you can see here is that on the left is Emanuel Ringelblum, on the right is Adam Chernyakov. Adam Chernyakov was the head of the Judenrat, the Jewish Council, which the Germans set up to run the ghetto and carry out their orders. And he kept a diary in Polish. And this is a facsimile of a page from his Polish diary. And this is a quotation from his diary. Emanuel Ringelblum, on the left, he was a labor Zionist and historian. He kept a diary in Yiddish. There's a facsimile of that diary and also a quotation in Yiddish and then, of course, in, in Polish and English translation. Now, these two individuals, one who, who uh, organized an underground archive that secretly um, documented everything going on in the Warsaw Ghetto, the other, an official who had daily, regular contact with the Germans, they are the two narrators in what is characteristic of the entire exhibition, which is that it's multi-voiced. There's no anonymous third person, uh, synthetic scholar, historian that is the lead voice in the exhibition. It is multi-voiced. In this case, it's two voices vis-a-vis. -vis. In other cases, it's even more. And the idea is that these voices make a kind of chorus, sometimes in harmony, sometimes in dissonance. Visitors can add their own voice. But even more specific, all the sources that are used here are from the period. So it's very unusual. There's no video survivor testimony that was made in the post-war years, that was made 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. If our visitors want to see survivor testimony, they go to our resource center, and we have the Spielberg, the Shoah archive. They can sit and they can watch survivor testimony. But here we have a unique opportunity, and that is that that clandestine archive that team that gathered this material in secret, diaries, reports, letters, ration tickets, counterfeit coins, they believed that they would survive and that after the war, they would write a book about the, uh, about the Warsaw Ghetto based on the archive. But during the Great Deportation in the summer of 1942, when they realized they wouldn't survive, they packed up the archive into milk cans and tin boxes and they buried it. And then, immediately after the war, um, several people who survived the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, some of whom fought in the Warsaw Uprising, they figured out where in the rubble were two of the three places where the, the, the tin boxes and milk cans had been buried, and they excavated them. And it's that material, it's the material that was in those milk cans and in those tin boxes that we have used to create the narrative of the, uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto Gallery, everything from, everything from the period. And so, we, as far as photography and film goes, we have to depend on German propaganda material. And so we've developed a strategy, what we would call image ethics, in the way in which we use that material because it's very important for us that our visitors know the source 
and that they know that what they're looking at, uh, who, who created it? Was it created, was it a, a diary written by Chernyakov or Ringelblum, or was it photography and film that was created by, by the Germans? There's more to be said about the Holocaust Gallery, but time uh, is limited, and I want to conclude uh, by saying a few words about the post-war period. Now, among our various stakeholders, there were those who thought that the whole exhibition should only be about the Holocaust. In fact, you'll forgive me, but some of our French donors thought it should only be about the void. So, very French, if I may say so. So, in other words, about emptiness, emptiness, emptiness. So, the, of course, that we rejected, and the idea that it would only be about the Holocaust, we also rejected, and the idea that the story would end with the Holocaust, we also rejected, because, in fact, the untold, uh, very much untold story is the story of, po of the post-war years. If you were to go to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in Lower Manhattan, you would discover that the, the first floor is 20 years or so before the Holocaust, the second floor is the Holocaust, the third floor is after the Holocaust, which means Israel and the United States, and a view of the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. And there's no Europe. Europe is a closed story. It's over. But it's not over. And so um, it turns out that in, from, from the perspective of people living in Poland today, this is perhaps the most important gallery and the most troubling, most difficult, and most controversial, as you can well imagine. And so Jews basically returned to a destroyed landscape. 90% of the 3,300,000 Jews living in Poland before the war were killed. Um, those who survived, mostly they survived in the Soviet Union. At the end of the war, about 250,000 Jews found themselves in Poland. They came out of hiding, they were liberated from concentration camps, they were repatriated from the Soviet Union, and they found themselves in an absolutely ruined landscape. This is what the Jewish neighborhood of pre-war Warsaw, this is what the ghetto looked like by the time uh, the war was over, and in the background you can see the destroyed city of Warsaw. And so the, the, the big question was whether to stay or to leave. Um, and that was a question, it was a burning question really, I think until the anti-Semitic events of 1968 and after that, there were so few Jews left in Poland that it was no longer, quote, the burning question, but whether to stay or to leave. And the answer is that most, most elected to leave. And over half of the survivors in Poland after the war, more than half of them, that is to say about 150,000 left between 1945 and 1948. And, um, and, and the big push came, the, if you will, emigration panic came after, some, uh, after um, uh, several instances of post-war violence. The most uh, troubling uh, being, if you will, the most iconic, I should say, being the pogrom in Kelsa, which Jan Gross has written about in a book called Fear. Now, what we did was, and I think this is very uh, characteristic of our approach, we stayed inside the period in presenting the pogrom, the Kelsa pogrom. And we started the story inside the apartment uh, before the pogrom broke out. These are young Zionists about to go to, is to, go, to, go to Palestine, and um, a, a Christian boy in the, in the building goes missing, and the Jews are accused of kidnapping and killing him. And so the pogrom uh, breaks out in the apartment and then in the street. And the way we present this is to present the bare facts, to present the funeral, to present trial testimony, and then to present four interpretations of this event from the period. What did the communists say? They blamed the anti-communist underground. What did the anti-communist underground say? They blamed the communists. What did the Bishop of Kelsa say? He blamed the Jews. And what did the, if you will, the independent thinkers, the intellectuals, some of them, from Warsaw University, for example, say? They, they, they basically asked Polish society. They asked, they said, how could this happen after the war, given everything that we know and everything that happened? And they, they, they didn't look to, to, blame, uh, to blame somebody else. They asked all of Polish society to really take this on. And so the, the debates that arose around uh, Jan Gross's book which were furious public debates, are, are for us a post-89 story, and we don't introduce that here. Here, we stay again inside the historical moment with sources and perspectives in the historical present of this historical moment, and we enlarge the story with examples, as you can see, written um, on the board, 
of, of other places, other forms of violence, and the opportunity to explore them in greater depth with documents, again, a kind of layering for the skimmers, the swimmers, and the divers. And the story, the emigration story, uh, then continues along one wall, which confronts vis-a-vis -vis the wall that's dedicated to staying. And the, the story of staying is very much a story of Jewish life under communism, which we present in uh, the only Jewish organization that was allowed under Stalinism, the Social and Cultural Association of Jews in Poland, and the only official space in which they could meet, which was the club, the club of the 1950s, the club of the 1960s, and then the last, uh, the last wave of emigration, which comes in the wake of an anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic campaign in 1968. At this point, there may be 25,000 Jews left in Poland, and about 13 to 15,000 leave, and about 10,000 are left. And this brings us to a period of a profound feeling of absence, the sense that the story is completely over, but that there are small, small signs of Jewish renewal. And it's in the period after 1989 that we present the story of Jewish renewal on a small scale and the enormous interest uh, in the part, on the part of Polish society in the history and culture of Polish Jews, what we call small numbers big presence, relatively small number of Jews by any measure, but enormous Jewish presence in Polish consciousness. And this part of the exhibition is in the space of the building itself, it, a space filled with light that soars from the exhibition level all the way up four stories to the roof. And in a sense, the visitor has come full circle. And the last thing that, we're, we're, that we are going to do is to create uh, kind of an epilogue of Polish Jews in the world, in other words, the diaspora, because um, of the almost 14 million Jews in the world, approximately 70% are thought to have their roots in this historic territory. And so their story will be at the very, very center, um, and the exhibition, in a sense, is a circle around it. Um, as of November 8th, in our first, year, first two years, uh, first year without the exhibition, just the building and our program. Second year with the exhibition, we've had a million visitors. And that includes, um, I would say, in the winter, 70% from Poland, 30% from abroad, maybe half of them Jewish from the diaspora and from Israel. And um, the, I think it's a unique situation in post-communist Europe that um, I don't see that kind of receptivity, not in Lithuania, not in Ukraine, not in Hungary. I think. I think the situation in Poland is a very, very unusual one, and it's the receptivity of, of Polish society, first and foremost, that has really made this exhibition and this museum possible. Thank you.